Hello, everyone. Brian Newbert here from uh, GoldenBlack.com uh, with my colleague Tom Dean Hart. This is your GoldenBlack.com Saturday simulcast. It is brought to you by our friends at the Premium Club Hotel. We thank them, as always, for their support. Um, Alan Karpik is not with us this weekend. He has not yet made bail. Um, <laughs> it's, just, it's just Tom and I this weekend to talk about uh, Purdue football training camp, whatever else might come up. So I'm just going to – I don't know anything. I don't know – what to talk about. I don't know what to ask about. So I'm just going to kind of be the quarterback here and put Tom in position to make plays. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Hey Tom, uh, for somebody who doesn't know anything, uh, <laughs> maybe give me, uh, five guys here real quick who you've been surprised by, who have been kind of the stories of camp here. You know, a lot, Brian, come on, man. Come on, man. You know, you got to go with number one first, right? Hudson card, the, the straw that stirs the drink in West Lafayette. He is uh, the Boilermakers' Reggie Jackson. I think I made that reference <laughs> with you another time. He's their number 44 yeah. batting cleanup from the left side of the plate. Um, yeah, you know, uh, this was the guy that Ryan Walters wanted right out of the portal. First order of business was to get himself a quarterback. Kind of funny to think that there ever was going to be a competition with him and Brady Allen, but um, I digress. So, yeah, Hudson Carter was the guy they wanted. He was always going to be the unquestioned starter. And um, the plaudits keep on coming, Brian. We saw more from Dave Refson after they visited, BTN visited camp on Wednesday. You know, he sent out a tweet that got a million likes and, has sent our message board off into another stratosphere of Hudson Card love. So that all started back in January with the workouts and through spring football, the coaches, the players, to a man. They were all effusive in their praise for Hudson Card. And, um, yeah, he certainly throws well, uh, can move, can extend plays with his feet. Seems like he's well-liked. Seems like a good guy. So, yeah, we'll see. It looks like maybe, maybe Purdue really has something here, Brian. I, I, under the radar transfer quarterback who's kind of got lost in the shuffle amid all the hype around these other guys. So I think he's he's got to be uh, the the alpha and the omega of any of any conversation of players who caught your eye and are creating a buzz this spring for Purdue. Um, I think um, you know defensively the that outside linebacker spot. Collectively, he's created a buzz. And individually, you know, I think you got to start with, with with Nick Scourton, the former Nick Carraway. Um, we saw glimpses last year, right, of what he was capable of. And we're going to get a full dose. In 2023, uh, you know, this defense, they want their ends just to get upfield, make plays, and get after the quarterback. And he certainly looks like he has that skill set. And you stack him on top of Corday Sidner. Kydron Jenkins, young Will Helt, Scotty Humpich, maybe the light bulb comes on for him. And then Roman Petrie. Brian, they've got six outside linebackers I think they like a lot. It appears to be maybe the strength of this, this new, uh, unique defense that Purdue's got. And and uh, so I think Scourton, uh, those outside linebackers, are very intriguing. Um, you know, going back to offense, you know, a tight end, Garrett Miller. You know, they've been sort of cautious with Garrett all throughout camp. We know he, he suffered that injury last last August, missed the entire season. All signs point to him being A-OK. -okay. He's basically said as much, but they, they don't want to press their luck in camp. But, you know, you've seen number 88, Brian. He's, he's a special player, I think. He's better than Payne Durham. Payne Durham was a fifth-round pick of the Buccaneers, and and I think we've always known Garrett Miller was the more talented tight end with the higher ceiling. Um, this 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 could be the year we really see his total package. And that this is strong tight end room, I think. Paul Perry and Max Clare and Drew Bibber. Max Clare, number 86, is really the young guy to watch. And they like their true freshman. I know you went to see the kid last year, George Barron um, from Mount Vernon. They like him a lot. He looks good, Brian. He just has to fill out. But I've heard a lot of good things about him. And that in the backfield, too, I think the backfield for Purdue, I think they got three legit backs, maybe their best collection of backs since uh, Jeff Brom's first year when the Atario Fuller and, you know, DJ Knox and Markel Jones and, and Richie Worship 
you got Mockaby, you got Tyrone Tracy, and you got Dylan Downing. Three pretty good running backs, I think, who are capable of uh, of, of carrying the load, uh, at least in small doses for the last two. And um, so, yeah, I'm eager to, to watch those guys, how they're used catching the ball especially. You know what? And then um, I, I guess uh, that receiving core, you know, Deion Burks is a guy who's dealt with some injury during camp. He was back out there on Thursday, but uh, he's he's kind of been described as a freak by a lot of people. Ryan Walters called him an action figure during media day. Uh, says he runs upwards of 22 miles an hour. Explosive, fast, strong, Brian. Maybe, maybe number four is that alpha receiver that this offense needs with Charlie Jones uh, now playing for the Bengals. That would be exciting to see Deion Burke's kung fu grip. There you go, kung fu grip. That's right. Uh, I got. I get paid by the take, so let me say a couple things here. Um, following up on some of the things you said uh, regarding Hudson Card, what an unbelievable luxury it would be if he's the guy here for three years, um, yeah. which by every indication, it would be a profound disappointment if he's not, even though Purdue is recruiting, is backfilling and recruiting at a very high level behind him. Um for a new staff, typically that's one of the first boxes you need to check is you have to find your quarterback. First of all, you have to generate enough momentum to get the kid you want. And then second, you got to put a year or two of, of development into him. So to have that guy from day one, um, mm-hmm. there have been staffs at Purdue that never found that guy. Uh, you know, Danny Hope never found that guy who could stay on the field. Uh, yeah. you, you know, Jeff Brom had um didn't really have that guy until Aiden O'Connell kind of rose to the top. Um, you mentioned Will Health. I saw him in person last year for Carmel twice. That guy is my pick to click in that whole class long term because he is everything you're looking for in that edge rusher. He is a pterodactyl from a height and length perspective. He's got a little bit of burst to him, but he just looks like what everybody's looking for now in that big, tall, rangy edge setter uh, and pass rusher. Uh, Garrett Miller, um, most athletic tight end at Purdue since Dustin Keller. Uh, I'm on yeah. record. Um, more Dude, of a big play guy than Payne Durham. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just a guy that when you look at Purdue's best case scenarios here for this season, the things that have to go right, I have to thank him having a great season, him having a healthy season is right up there at the top of the list. So um, what do you think? Maybe give me a couple of real hot button things that you think have to go right for this team uh, to have the sort of season it wants to have beyond the obvious stuff, like, you know, health and, and, and yeah. kind of all that stuff. Um, well, it's kind of funny. You know, I was talking to, to, to Jerry DiNardo And this was something that had crossed my mind. He articulated it unsolicited, too, was uh, complimentary football, Brian. You know, at Illinois. I've heard that before. (laughs) At at Illinois, you know, Brett Bielema's offense is very much ball control, right? Pound you, control the clock, drain the clock, a physical offense, typically. And Purdue's offense probably is not going to obviously be like that. It's going to be more of a quick tempo. Sometimes it's going to go no huddle. So the point is, maybe there's, there's, there's three and outs. The offense is on and off the field at a more rapid pace than, than what the, uh, that Illinois defense had to deal with last year. So it, I guess it'll be interesting to see um, how if they, if they have to make any adjustments. Donato thought maybe they would have to be less aggressive defensively. I don't know. But yeah. um, I guess that's something to keep on your radar, sort of a nebulous thought. But um, I think it's something worth bringing up. Um, you know, from a, from a uh, position standpoint, that's secondary. Um, uh, yeah, I know there's two veteran safeties and Cam Allen and Sanusi came at the cornerback spot in particular. That's that's the area to watch. Um, the only veteran back is Jamari Brown. Every other significant cornerback on this roster is a new guy, a junior college transfer, a freshman, redshirt freshman, or a uh, transfer. Uh, you talk about flushing out a position. The cornerback spot has been totally flushed out. I think they like the kid from Penn State the most, number 16, Marquise Wilson. I think he'll, uh, I'd be shocked if he's not starting one of the starting corners, the number one cornerback. They like Marquevious Brown of Ole Miss, who wears number one. 
Uh, and they, they also like Ryan, the junior college transfer, Otris Alessandro, which kind of surprised me. Um, real late addition of this class. Uh, he's got nice, nice length. He's got a great story, too. I don't want to get into all that, but Botros Alexander, number nine, Alessandro, number 19, is a guy to watch. That cornerback spot in particular, like I said, has got to show a little something because they gave up a lot of big plays in the secondary last year. I know that's not always the secondary's fault, but I think we saw our share of blown coverages, missed tackles. Uh, I always flash back to the Syracuse game. Uh, so there, and then, and then along those same lines, I think the offensive line. You know, like the secondary, the cornerback spot, that's the one position that really has had the largest injection of transfer talent. Six transfers, Brian, on the offensive line. I think I think at least two are going to start this year, maybe three. Uh, I think the kid from UNLV, Preston Nichols, will start at one guard spot. Jalen Grant from Bowling Green is going to start either at center or at a guard spot, I think. And then maybe Austin Johnson from Colorado is your center if, if Josh Kaltenberger is not ready for the opener. So yeah, I like the tackles. I think um, Musa and, and, and Bo are legit tackles. The strength of that line, the depth behind him is a little, a little iffy, though, Brian. they got to keep those two big guys healthy. But, again, just watch that offensive line and how it develops and watch the cornerback position, and let's see how that develops, too. Yeah, I've been uh... – it's funny you mentioned complimentary football. I've been writing about that since the day Ryan Walters was hired. Is that he, if you want to have a big play defense, a big play offense, but also win with defense, it's you tend to be good at what you practice against, mm -hmm. you know. And and I think that you saw that at Illinois last year. You see that at Iowa every year. You see that at Wisconsin every year. Um, I think that you know. If Purdue's going to be a big play offense in the passing game, as they, they seem to intend to be, which isn't to say they're not going to ride Devin Mockaby for all they can get of him this year. Uh, it is going to be interesting to see if the offense can, you know, piece together long enough drives uh to keep the defense on the field because yeah, that's part of playing good defense is not being gassed in the fourth quarter. You know, how much causation there was back in the Tiller years. Uh, you know, there were a lot of big plays. There were a lot of three and outs um, against good teams. And then it, maybe it wasn't a coincidence sometimes where the defense wasn't the best. The defense could be in the uh, fourth quarter. So that I've said my piece. I, I think I said uh, back in the winter or the spring that every time you see me write the term complimentary football, you should take a drink because it's going to be that big of a – I think it's going to be that big of a storyline that, you know, people might easily overlook – how uh, how concerned should Purdue be over Gus Hartwig? I sort of uh, I get the sense there's a chance we may not see Gus till October. Um, I think they want to be careful with him. He's been on the practice field, Brian. He's been in uniform lately, but just sort of doing stuff on the side, going through warm-ups, not going through any of the individual drills with the O-line or anything. So it's a good sign he's out there, but mm – -hmm. For sure, he's not going to be there uh, for the opener, probably the second game. And like I said, this thing could bleed into maybe late September. I don't know. Um, I just think it's up in the air. And, was, you know, they'll take it a week at a time. Gus, Gus is good center, I think, you know. Oh, no, he, he's, he be, he's the foundation of that offensive line. I think he's one of yeah. the best NFL prospects. Yeah, he is. That'd have been, I yeah, think he's one of your best players. Just a yeah. really, really unfortunate turn of events for him and Purdue alike. Yeah. Um, uh, just a completely random question here. I've been uh, wrestling with mm. how to describe this season. Obviously, Purdue is – this is a very new start for Purdue. Uh, most of its best players are gone. Um, but this is the first time in my frame of reference at Purdue where Purdue is replacing a coach who had success, who moved on to something else. This wasn't somebody who got fired for losing. Would you call this a rebuild? What would you call this? I guess I would. I would call it a rebuild, given the, the attrition on the roster. Mm -hmm. um, number one, would you have four or five NFL draft picks? The most they've had, I can't remember what it was since, since 2008 or something. In fact, you got, I think, 35 newcomers between freshmen and transfers and junior college transfers. 
I believe that's what the number I counted up once was 35 or in that range. That's incredible. And then you look at the the new staff and the new schemes, right? And uh, that's just another ingredient that makes it a rebuild, I think. Um, so I, I think those three things, the loss of some premier, some of the program's best talent has had in over a decade, all the newcomers and a new staff with new schemes. Yeah, I, I, I feel comfortable calling this a rebuild. Uh, for a program coming off that Big Ten championship game appearance. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, Purdue's recruiting didn't recruit maybe at the highest or as high a level uh, in the last couple of years as they did early on. Uh, I think part of that was staff turnover. I think part of it was just things kind of wearing off a little bit, as, you know, sometimes happens. I think these two staffs are polar opposites, so I think that's part of a rebuild dynamic, too, is people – Yeah people getting used to a very different approach and very different personality type across the board. Um, but at the same time that, you know, a lot of the guys back and college football nowadays is there might be a skeleton crew of guys returning from one year to the next, as is kind of the case at Purdue is they're sort of used to success now. Uh, whereas yeah. oftentimes when you fire a losing coach, the guys there are just tired of losing and that kind of helps you a little bit in year one, but um, it's an interesting topic and one we can uh, continue to flush out as the, uh, as the weeks and months go by here, obviously. You know, I, I can't think of a Purdue head coach who left West Lafayette and went directly to another job, head coaching job. Jim Young. He, he, he was at Purdue for one year. He had like a sabbatical year where he just worked in the athletic department and, and then he went to army um, of course, Joe Tiller retired. Jack Molenkoff retired as well. So everybody else was fired. But yeah, Jim Young had one year where he was in West Lafayette just as like an associate AD in charge of shuffling papers. And then he took that job at Army. So yeah, that, that kind, of, <laughs> kind of gives you a snapshot yeah, of, it's, of how trying this job is. It's also kind of reflective of Purdue's history. People don't want to hear it, but this is a tough place to win. And, you know, it's it's yeah. uh, the job Jeff Brom did here, you know, um, was no small feat. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, I, I, the I, record wasn't, you know, eye popping, but the context of what he took over, you know, was pretty significant. I think what you pointed out in your weekly word about, you know, he, he never really could get that that blue chip quarterback recruit. You know, it's it was it was kind of interesting. Jack Plummer. Yeah. Um, you know, Brady Allen will never know about, I guess. And and uh, Aiden O'Connell was a walk-on. David Blau wasn't his guy. Tim Bullard uh, wasn't, wasn't his guy. wasn't his guy. Yeah, just sort of, sort of strange how – I mean, they, they did a good job with the quarterbacks they had. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they knew how to coach people up. But they could never bring in that, that four-star quarterback. And you, you point out where Walters has been here less than a year. And uh, he got carved out of the portal – and got a four-star kid in, in 2024 and a pretty highly thought of three-star kid for 2025 already. So just kind of interesting, isn't it? And you talked about um, this staff being different from a vibe standpoint. I think we're seeing it reflected in its recruiting early on too. Yeah, yeah. Um, it'll be interesting. Um, it just all comes down to Hudson Card. I mean, that's – that's just the nature of the quarterback position, the nature of Purdue's situation right now. And, uh, you know, Purdue has a pretty decent thing going in Texas right now. And Purdue historically has had some success with guys from Texas yeah, at that position. Um, That's not, what to, I was not to draw I unfounded comparisons, but uh, it does bear mentioning. So um, I think it's always funny when, when, when conferences are getting ready to expand, they always go, well, they need SMUs. And then the other schools in that conference can go recruit in Texas. That is – Well, that how, stuff is how, less how, true Purdue, than ever. How's Purdue getting guys out of Texas when the Big Ten doesn't have any teams in Texas? Yeah, that stuff is less matter. true than ever because <laughs> – It doesn't matter. It it used to be where kids wanted to – if a kid was from Ohio, he'd want to go to Ohio State or Michigan so that he could play yeah, close to home and his family could see him play. But now it's just everything's so nationwide, everything's so coast to coast that – I'm not sure how how much that stuff matters. You know, there was there was something written about Oregon and Washington coming to the Big Ten. That USC didn't want them coming to the Big Ten because they didn't want them recruiting in LA. 
Have to, yeah. What says that they have to stop recruiting in LA if they're in the Pac-12? It's ridiculous. Uh, that doesn't that doesn't make any sense to me. But it will it's be interesting to see how those California kids for UCLA and USC and those other two West Coast schools respond to uh, the prospect of instead of playing, you know, at at Stanford uh, in November, they have to go to Iowa. I'd you know, rather, I mean, are you kidding me? If I'm a football player at USC, I'd rather play these games and go to Corvallis, Oregon, or go to Tucson, or go to well, Coleman. I got to get a chance to play some some better teams in the Big Ten. Yeah, but the weather is what I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, when Danny Hope took the job here, he really emphasized recruiting Florida. And I will never forget the visuals of those dudes all sitting on the top of the bench by the heater in their coats on the sideline during games. It's, 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 uh, it's not like those guys didn't have to travel North a lot and play in, in, yeah. in semi cold weather, but it's going to be interesting to see how, what kind of recruiting ramifications um, maybe USC and UCLA, especially in Southern California face now being in, in more of a Midwestern based I think that's still fair to say. I mean, it's a coast-to-coast -coast conference, but the majority is still in middle America. It is. It is. Um, but got, it'll be interesting. I haven't, I, I haven't heard this from you. I think people would like to hear it from you. For you and in Brian Newbert's eyes, what constitutes a successful 2023 season? For Purdue? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, just show enough promise to lead people to believe that you're on to something here and if you go six and six and make a bowl game, I mean, that was success under Jeff Brom. That's more than success now. Uh, you know, five and seven, I think you can live with considering how hard the schedule is, considering how brand new everything is. Uh, but I do think all outcomes are on the table. But I think if you can just at least flirt with 500, um, I think in the context of the situation, I think you're okay. People don't want to hear that. People want to hear, you know, uh, oh, well, they won the Big Ten West last year. They can do it again this year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's tough, man. You've never seen most of these guys play. Uh, the majority of Purdue people probably couldn't even tell you a bunch of guys who were going to be on the field in day one. Couldn't even tell you their yeah. names, myself included. I've tried to pay attention to this stuff. I've tried to keep all the names straight. I, I, I'm going to need that that roster in front of me during that first game for sure. Um, so you just don't know what to expect. But I tend to be more conservative with these things. I think that given how new everything is, given how much the schedule stiffens, uh, given how challenging that September can be, um, which isn't to say they can't win three or four games in September. It's just all of those games might be handfuls for Purdue. and um, It's just too hard to tell, but I just think that, you know, had Purdue gone, you know, Purdue going six and six in year one under Brom um, or whatever the record was, seven and six. Six and uh, six, seven and six, yeah. Because they won the bowl game, yeah. yeah and – uh, I think that was rousing success. I, As much as we talked about the rebuilding question before, I think that the circumstances aren't all that different. I, I, I think Purdue's roster is brand new. That's not just a Purdue thing. I think that that's the case everywhere now in college football. It's just the the nature of the beast. It's, it's, it's kind of hungry, hungry hippos for players uh, in the spring. And everybody's got a new team every year. And you just don't know what to expect. But Personally, I think if Purdue goes six and six, you should be pretty happy about that. And I, I, I'm guessing Purdue probably would. Um, they'd obviously want more and want to build towards something bigger, but I think that'd be a hell of a starting point. Now I got to go out and see if I can find my hungry hungry hippos game. All right. Well, we'll let you get to that. You can go to the Toys R Us that closed twelve years ago over by over by the mall. Um, is that, so is that Tigo or. Ganip Ganop or something. I don't even know where you get that stuff anymore. Target, maybe? <laughs> uh, all right. So we have kind of gone off the rails here. We're talking about plastic hippos eating marbles. Uh, so this has been your goldenblack.com Saturday simulcast. Thank you to the Premium Club Hotel for your support. As always, when you come into town for football weekends this year, nice. keep them in mind. Uh, classy. Um, 
just want a, a couple little house cleaning things here. Uh, just remember, keep in mind during football season, start of basketball season, goldenblack.com. We are, we are, uh, we're not messing around here. We're really taking this stuff seriously, covering these, covering these programs. We go to the games, we cover the games, we cover recruiting. Um, we've been out in front of a lot of stuff in basketball. Tom's done a great job all summer. Uh, keeping things compelling with a lot of compelling storylines to cover. That'll only get more compelling as the games start. If you've not yet joined us at goldenblack.com, please consider doing so. We don't think you will regret it. If you are listening to this on YouTube or whatever podcast platform you might um, be taking advantage of, please consider giving us a five-star review, um, leaving us a review. Uh, that would be much appreciated. Um for some re that's important for some reason i'm not sure exactly what that reason is but uh everybody else says it so i figured i would too yeah. so uh yeah all right i have completely lost control of this thing i i'm a terrible host next week alan will be back and he will keep the trains running on time he won't just sit here and babble like i am so uh tom thank you for your time once again and uh we will talk to you guys all again next week if not sooner thank you Take care.